Okay, let's see if that works. Welcome back to the Convo Couch, everyone. Pasta Jardula here. Guys, do us a favor. Uh, if you're on our YouTube right now, share it out there. Uh, get it out. It, it's kind of weird, though, because as you're sharing it, the link is different on Twitter. But let us know if you're still having that same problem as well. Uh, the links are right on YouTube and Rockman, so it's a little bit kind of crazy to see what's going on. Um, please do us a favor to like, share. Thank you so much for everybody who jumped on in today. Got a special show today. Uh, I met this gentleman at a wedding not too not too long ago uh, in the Global South, but I've seen him on RT before. Uh, I've always wanted to talk to him because I really didn't know a lot. I didn't kind of dive in to the Kosovo situation the way I did with Ukraine. You know, in Ukraine in 2015, uh, I realized that I had to understand everything that was going on. So I went back and I looked and I studied and I saw what happened in 2014. I even went back to 1991 and saw America's involvement. But what we're seeing in 2014 right now, from 2014, excuse me, to 2022 in the Ukraine, uh, draws a lot of parallels from a lot, what a lot of people have been telling me about Kosovo. So with us today, here he is. He's a contributor for RT uh, and he's an awesome man. He's got a lot of knowledge. He's from the region. My good friend, Neb. How you doing, Neb? Hey, Pasta. I'm doing all right. How are you? If you want to attempt to say your first and last name and tell the audience, I'd appreciate it. But the, I didn't want to butcher it because I thought we're off to a good start as friends. And I don't want to kind of ruin that in any way, shape or form. I appreciate it. It's Neboy Shamalic. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, I understand completely it is difficult you. for a lot of people to get. So Neb is fine. <laughs> when you said it, it was like, God bless you, sir. But Neb, you know, it was awesome. It was great hanging with you. Uh, we got to know each other on a personal level a little bit. But now let's dive into some business because I had told you before that I want to do this show. Uh, I don't want to necessarily call it Kosovo for dummies because I don't want to be too, you know, make people feel too stupid about what's going on. We have a completely propagandized media. Uh, and we're going to go over some things and we're going to unpack on how this Kosovo situation all began, how it started, uh, where we're at in Kosovo today, and kind of the parallels to what's going on in Ukraine. You kind of mentioned something of that significance to me. Uh, can you uh, valid uh, validate that statement I said, that there are parallels with what's going on in Ukraine from what happened? Well, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it's not just me saying this. None other than Vladimir Putin literally said that just the other week when he was meeting with the UN Secretary General. Uh, if people have seen that famous scene with the long desk at the Kremlin and Guterres is sitting on one end and Putin is sitting on the other and, and the Russian president says, look, you know, when you had the decision of the court about Kosovo's independence and it, you know, it clearly said this and Guterres is like, yes, but the UN hasn't recognized Kosovo, to which Putin replies, but the Americans did. And a lot of people came back to me with questions after that happened because they couldn't figure out what was really going on? Because again, Putin has been monitoring this for for years. He's he's been um, he's keenly aware of the Kosovo situation. I would actually argue later on in the show that this was one of the reasons for the change of government in Russia in in uh, early two thousand. That's how Putin came to power. Uh, but Gutierrez is not, not a spring chicken either. He also has some sort of memory of the situation, even if it's based on mainstream reporting and institutional. And so, but a lot of people aren't really familiar with it and they only know what they've been told uh, in, in the media and that the, their picture's incomplete at best. So I would like to help fill in the details if possible. One thing to guide us uh, here is that famous line from the reimagined Battlestar Galactica, all of this has happened before and all of this will happen again. Battlestar Galactica references. You are my guy. Let's get into this fun class today. So let's bring up the map of Yugoslavia because this is something important. I want to know uh, what what are the countries that made up of Yugoslavia were made up of Yugoslavia and how long ago? What's the birth of Yugoslavia? How long have they been around? And, you know, when so, did they start disassembling or breaking off into other countries? Right. The map you have up is basically Yugoslavia on the eve of its destruction. This is early 1991. And you will see uh, going uh, west to east, north to south, you will see Slovenia in the top left, then Croatia, which is sort of a, a crescent shaped um, uh, right underneath, and then Bosnia, Herzegovina and the heartland. You have Montenegro on the southern part of the Adriatic coast. You have Serbia as the eastern anchor, and you have Vojvodina and Kosovo, which are the two provinces inside Serbia. So sort of subunits. 
-hmm. And then in the, um, on the far eastern side, at the very bottom of the map, you have Macedonia, today known as North Macedonia. Okay. So these six um, republics were drawn up by the uh, communist government in 1945. 1945, got uh, it. When Yugoslavia was reestablished after Nazi occupation. Uh, the, they were not, they did not originally exist in Yugoslavia. It was, it was set up after World War I. The, um, prior to World War I, in, in, um, as of 1913, 1914, you had Serbia and Montenegro as independent countries. Uh, the uh, territory of present-day Kosovo and Macedonia was still controlled by the Ottoman Empire. And uh, your what is today Slovenia, Croatia, Vojvodina, and Bosnia was controlled by Austria-Hungary. Okay. And then in my hometown, down the street from where I was born, this Serbian student by the name of Gavrilo Princip uh, points his gun at the Austrian heir, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and targets him and the military governor, Oskar Potjorek, who was riding in the car with him. Mm -hmm. Princip, unfortunately, was a lousy shot who didn't have very much practice. So he kills Ferdinand, misses Potjorek entirely, shoots Ferdinand's wife, uh, Duchess Sophie, and they both die. And Austria-Hungary uses this as a pretext to declare war on Serbia, which it blames on, you know, for this you know, terrorist act in the Austrians' uh, view. And they get a blank check from the Germans to do this. The German, the, 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 the German Kaiser in Berlin was like, yeah, you do, do whatever, just do it quickly. But the Austrians don't do it quickly, and the whole thing stretches into July 1914. And next thing you know, the Russians are mobilizing, the French are mobilizing, the British are mobilizing, and you have a European you know, continental war that grows into a world war. Yeah. Well, four years later, Austria-Hungary is on the ropes. Russia has been knocked out of the war by um, the well, yeah, by the Bolshevik Revolution at that point, because this is late or late October, early November. And uh, of, 20, of uh, 1917, and you have the remnants of the Serbian army, which had survived, uh, which had basically retreated from um, Serbia in 1915 uh, after an Austro-German offensive and decamped in Greece with the French and British support. And they break through the German and Bulgarian lines and keep going until they reach Belgrade and keep going. They're out, outrunning the French cavalry. The British are like three days behind. They have no clue what's going on. They cannot believe that these Balkan peasants are just outrunning everybody on foot. Are they, are they going north? In the they're country? going north and they're yeah. going west. Gotcha. And they're headed towards Vienna. There's actually a marker in Austria today that says Serbian army reached this point and went no further in 1918. Got it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Vienna sues for peace, and obviously Austria-Hungary Austria starts fracturing. You have all of these, you know, um, ethnics declaring independence. Part of it is in today's Ukraine, the far westernmost part. Um, uh, you know, you, you've got what became Czechoslovakia. You have what got became, you know, the Transylvania part of Romania. It's, it's, it's a whole big mess that I'm not going to get too into granularity, but I want to set the stage for the formation of Yugoslavia, which is basically the union of the Kingdom of Serbia and Montenegro as restored from Austro-German occupation and the self-proclaimed state of Croats, Slovenes, and Serbs that was basically the Austrian South Slavic territories, present-day Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, and Northern Serbia, aka Vojvodina, which means just means duchy. And um, so Yugoslavia gets set up after World War I uh, against the backdrop of Soviet Russia, Soviet Union mm -hmm. and the Treaty of Versailles and with the French basically trying to use it as a counterpoint to Germany and have this whole little entente of Yugoslavia, Romania and Czechoslovakia set up. There's internal problems in Yugoslavia though because um, you've got your um, all of these people speak more or less the same language that's how they sort of got united except that they are divided by religion. You okay. have people who became Catholics under the Habsburgs, you have people who became Muslim under the Ottoman Turks, and you have uh, the Serbs and uh, later Macedonians who were Orthodox Christians. And uh, there were all sorts of uh, tensions between them on account of different political histories and uh, religion and language and so on and so forth. In the 1930s, 
the king is assassinated. He basically disbanded the parliament and said, you people are a bunch of savages who are shooting each other in, in the, in the you know, one parliamentarian shot another over an insult. Um, there was a Serb from Montenegro who shot a Croatian parliamentarian well, because he, he felt insulted over World War I. And the king is like, screw this. I'm, I'm basically calling a dictatorship and, and repartitioning the country into provinces and I'm going to force you all to become Yugoslavs because you're, you're not going to be feuding on my watch. Mm -hmm. Well, he gets shot while visiting France. And the country is ruled by a weak regency that is, you know, basically the English and the Germans try to pull it both directions. And in the spring of 1941, the regency government finally decides to surrender to the Germans because obviously the British are losing everywhere. And then the people revolt because they still remember World War I. Mm -hmm. there's there's evidence that the British Secret Service has had a hand in, in that as well, but it was mostly just riding the wave. Hitler gets pissed off, invades, destroys the country, partitions it in, in between Germany and, and Italy and Hungary and Bulgaria, and uh, creates independent state of Croatia, which was Nazi allied. And then you have twin resistance movements. You have the Serbian royalists and you have the communists who are, you know, more for either partitioning Yugoslavia entirely or reuniting it, but under their rule, whichever comes first. And in 1945, the communists end up being the victorious party in, the, in, the, in that civil war and they reestablish Yugoslavia. But what they do is instead of using the king's provinces, which they hate, they try to restitch it together using the Soviet model of ethnic republics. And you have Slovenia, you have Croatia, you have Bosnia as a sort of a compromise because you can't have, you can't restore Croatia to what it used to be, not after all the atrocities they committed. And the, but then you, Serbia is too big according to this model, so they have to subpartition it, and this is why they create Vojvodina, which is mostly ethnically Serb. Uh, at that point, there's a small Hungarian population and the ethnic Germans that used to live there. Uh, that were one of the mainstays of German occupation uh, were basically sent to Germany as part of the great migration at, at the end of the war, the great ethnic cleansing in Central Europe. You know, this is why there's no Germans in Poland, by the way. Same reason. And so you, you, you're, they're creating these subsections, not necessarily on an ethnic principle, but simply because Serbia is too big. They need to cut it down to, to a manageable size. And the other such province is Kosovo. Now, what's complicating things is that there's a, there's a large number of ethnic Albanians in Kosovo that had uh, been a favored population by the Ottoman Empire. When Serbia took that area in 1912 during the Balkan Wars, they didn't really have much of a chance to administer it by the time the Austrians and the Germans came in in 1915. So after the war, they, they set up this policy of, you know, bringing in more Serbs to settle the area and, you know, wanting to integrate it into their territory. And then at the start of the German invasion, all of these people are rounded up and expelled, and they, they annex, the Germans annex Kosovo to the Italian protectorate of Albania. And I'm talking Kosovo as, as, a, as a general area. It didn't have a set borders or anything. And then after the war, when the Yugoslav communist government decided to repartition the country, they basically drew these boundaries and put all of these ethnic Albanians in there and treated it as a sort of a separate ethnic Albanian entity, mm -hmm. even after the split with Albania proper, because Andrew Hoxha uh, at one point decided that nobody's a real communist. He's the only true heir of, uh, of Lenin and, and Stalin and so on, and decided to go on this Maoist bend and Albania completely self-isolated. But there was a lot of traffic on that border because it was porous. And Yugoslavia and Albania for the longest time had a very strained relationship. Okay. This is like this 1945 we're at, right? Is that where we're at? What year? This is, so this start, I, I'm at this point into the 1970s, basically. Okay. This, so this is going on. to the 70s, it was still pretty much like under Soviet control. But well, so like Yugoslavia, right? So Yugoslavia broke off from the Soviet control in 1948. There was a famous feud between Tito and Stalin. It got banished from the inter the, the international, the common form. Um, there was a there was a big crisis in 48, and um, it didn't end until 53 when Stalin died. 
Got it. Uh, and NATO, which had, was created in 49, was already making overtures and sending all these weapons and equipment, the World War II surplus, to Tito's government, trying to fortify it against the Soviets. And then when Khrushchev took over in 54, um, Tito basically said, oh, no, we're going to be neutral. And throughout the Cold War, he pursued this policy of not just neutrality, but what we called non-alignment with a lot of the newly liberated African countries and Asian countries. It was basically like, we don't want to be part of any bloc. We're just going to be neutral, independent, sovereign. Don't touch us. Don't, you know, we're, we're not going to bother you. You don't bother us. Everybody's happy. So, so Yugoslavia was sort of a buffer country, you know, a socialist country that wasn't part of the Soviet bloc. It ha had friendly relations with NATO, but not, it wasn't on their side. It, it was, it was a very useful relationship for, for just about everybody. Yeah. So now, the Iron Curtain ran like up north of it, pretty much. Right? right. You had you had Hungary and Romania and Bulgaria that had like they were members of the Warsaw Pact and were firmly in the Soviet bloc, um, but you had Yugoslavia that was acting independently and wasn't part of it, and it had its own independent military. It had its own independent military industry. I mean, obviously, a lot of our weapons were based on the Soviet model, but we weren't part of the Soviet bloc. Got it. Tito dies in 1980. Doesn't leave an heir. Um, they decide to have a committee run things in, in his stead and have each republic and province, so for a total of eight, delegate a member to the committee, and they rotate. Well, as you can guess, this is not a very good recipe for running a country or anything, for that matter. Mm -hmm. And things start, the wheels off the, start falling, going off the bus. Uh, you have uh, almost right away ethnic Albanian protests demanding that they be recognized as a separate republic. In Kosovo. In Kosovo. In Kosovo. Right. You have all sorts of incidents of, there was an in famous incident when an Albanian soldier or recruit in the army uh, grabbed his rifle and shot a bunch of his colleagues while they slept. And there were more than, there was, an, I believe, one other incident where somebody used a hand grenade for the same purpose. Throughout the 80s, basically the Yugoslav government had to keep a state of emergency in Kosovo and deploy extra police and the military to preserve order because of the ethnic Albanian rebellion. But it didn't really escalate to a level of war. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. The ethnic Albanians in Kosovo, they wanted to have their own country. They didn't want to become part of Albania. They wanted uh, to So own that that's some of them did, some right? of them didn't. Okay. Um, I mean, the, the, because Albania was so insular and impoverished, um, at that point in the 80s, they wanted Kosovo as a republic with the idea that it would eventually become an independent state and then annex Albania. Uh -huh. uh, but the overarching ambition of Albanian nationalists, which they're proud of and they boast about openly, goes back to the 1870s when they originally rebelled against the Ottomans and wanted to create what they call natural Albania. So all the lands that they consider theirs, which includes present-day Albania, parts of Greece, most of Macedonia, northern Macedonia, um, Kosovo and another chunk of Serbia, as well as about a third of Montenegro present day. Oh, yeah, okay, gotcha. And that's are there, are there still ethnic Albanians living in those areas though now to this day? Uh, some, you know, yes, not yeah. uh, Right, they're not a majority in all of the, all, all of the territories that they claim. Yeah, uh, but there's a significant presence yeah. um, in in, in a, a lot of. And the uh, ethnic Albanians, by the way, it's more about. And you described this, and I want to tell my audience this so they can grasp this right now. This was always about more about nationalism than it was about right. religion, right? So uh, religion is a fact. So religion is a factor because, again, uh, the ethnic Albanians had a privileged position as a majority Muslim community under the Ottoman Empire, but. Present day, there's a there's a, a minority of Orthodox and Christian uh, and Catholic Christians among them in Albania proper. Okay. The vast majority of, of Albanians in Kosovo are Muslim, and um, that's a, definitely a factor in their conflict with with the Serbs, who are mainly Orthodox Christian. But they have also attacked Turks and other uh, Muslim groups that were not ethnically Albanian. So it's not entirely religious. The, their Absolutely. motivation is, yeah. is very much. And just to be clear, unlike these other groups that were part of Yugoslavia that I described, which were all, generally speaking, South Slavic, Albanians are not. They're, they're a distinct group um, by language, by, uh, you know, 
this was a thing before all these genetic maps came in, but they're, they're a very distinct group and always have been. They claim to be descended from the ancient Illyrians. There's really no evidence of, of, of that, but they, they consider themselves very separate and they have been separate and treated separately throughout history. So we come to the 19, end of the 1980s and the Yugoslavia is in crisis. Um, the economic situation is pretty bad, just as everywhere. And um, the uh, maintaining the police and military presence in Kosovo is expensive. And so it triggers this chain reaction that destroys the Yugoslav Communist Party. With the Slovenians basically saying, we don't want to pay for Kosovo anymore. It's too expensive. Hmm. And the Slovenians at that point have a sort of a privileged position because they're the designated exporters. They're the westernmost republic, and they do a lot of foreign trade, and they do a lot. They have a lot of industry that uh, sells the finished products to the West, while extracting yeah. raw materials from the rest of the country. Yeah, but isn't and so they want to keep the money and run? Isn't Slovenia for or like? There's other. There's Croatia and Bosnia yeah. is in between, and Montenegro and and Serbia is between uh, Slovenia and Kosovo, right? Um. Yes. Okay. So Slovenia is like the the, the northwesternmost republic. Yes. And um, they they initiate this this fight, and then it sort of s- snowballs into you know Croatia uh, uh, is is up next and says, well, we don't we want our independence, and um, then then the whole thing just starts unraveling until you know Bosnia, uh, you, you've got Bosnia breaking up, and that that directly impacted me because I mentioned I was born in Sarajevo, right what right where World War One started, and I lived through that particular civil war from ninety two to ninety five. Uh, which was not pleasant, and that's an understatement. Mm-hmm. But this is all unraveling in like the early '90s. Yes, and you have um, you have the United States, which is not necessarily the driver of this process. Uh, Germany's driving the early part of Yugoslavia's uh, dissolution. Germany reunites, the Berlin Wall falls. The Germany reunites, and all of a sudden, the first thing that they do, foreign policy wise, is insist on Yugoslavia's breakup and independence for Slovenia and Croatia, and they literally blackmail the rest of the European community into going along with this in order to become the European Union. Okay, let's stop there for a second. So Germany, the wall goes down. Okay, now they're back to a whole country, Germany, like they were before. Uh, They were split up after World War II. Mm -hmm. And they actually say that Yugoslavia needs to start breaking up and... Who's in charge of Yugoslavia right now at, at this moment? I believe you said it's kind of like a a board of sorts. It's a committee, or, right? A committee. So, um, I mean, how long did this committee rule for, by the way? Yeah. Say again. How long did, was this committee in charge for? So like, you were talking about close to like 12, 13, 14 years now. Um, it's about years, right? eleven. It's about eleven years, roughly. So uh, Tito dies in in May of nineteen eighty. Yeah. The, com- the, the president made up of is what I'm trying to figure out. That um, said, hey, hey, screw you. Well, um, you have delegates coming from the republics, and there, um, I b- believe, the last chairman of the presidency was Croatian, um, and he was, um, I'm, I'm trying to remember, I believe he was appointed as chairman in like March of 1991, and he famously said, his name is Stipe Mesic, and he fi- famously said when he came back to Zagreb, I have fulfilled my mission, Yugoslavia no longer exists. Uh-huh. His mission was to destroy the country he presided over. Got it. Um, but you basically, at this point in 1991, so this is you know, 10 years after Tito died, you have Croatian and Slovenian separatism basically unraveling Yugoslavia. You had, uh, they claimed that the reason they were trying to escape the country was the rise of Serbian nationalism because they were pointing to the Serbian party chairman, Slobodan Milosevic, who... Um, basically rose to power in 1987 by condemning the Kosovo Albanian um, violence against the Serbs and went to Belgrade, deposed the current party leadership, said, you, you're feckless, you're not doing anything, and proposed the constitutional reform that would have the provinces um, that Vojvodina Voj- and Kosovo were technically having veto power over anything that Serbia proper decided. Mm-hmm. So Milosevic proposed a constitutional reform that would relegate them to uh, status of provinces. That was so, late 80s that happened? Or? This is 1987 through 89. Okay. So Milosevic has this constitutional reform, which, which follows proce- proper procedure and everything, and basically makes Serbia equal to other republics. Got it. Which, as I mentioned earlier, 
goes it, it it's it goes in the and in, in with the letter of the law as it was written but goes against the spirit of what Tito set up back in the 40s to have a weak Serbia that that can that is counterbalanced with all these other republics because at that point I believe Serbia had as many people as the rest of the republics combined gotcha and so the Croatian and Slovenian separatists basically invoke this as an excuse to leave you have uh, again bosnia which is uh, has a large um, muslim population as well as a large serb population and a small croatian population that they had this power sharing agreement and that ended up getting violated on offer from the americans and i'm bringing this up because it's important for ukraine mm -hmm. because the same um the same uh, procedure we saw just recently there was a report in ukrainian media that, uh, and forgive me for the digression, but it makes sense, I promise. So the Ukrainian media recently said that Boris Johnson, the British prime minister, came to Kiev on April 9th and basically said, if you're willing to negotiate with the Russians, we are not. If you make peace, forget about our support. Yeah. So this, to me, parallels with the American ambassador to Yugoslavia, the last one, by the name of Warren Zimmerman, did in March of 1992. He literally met with the Bosnian Muslim leader and said, I know you signed this power sharing agreement with Serbs and Croats, but if you don't like it, you can unsign it and we'll support you. These are the this is the Bosnians he's telling. This you is so. right. This is the American ambassador telling the Bosnian Muslim leader. This is where you have your civil war from now. Exactly. And is Izabegovic does what he he's told. He unsigns the, the power sharing agreement. Okay. Can and it breaks out within weeks. All right. Let me ask you a question right now. Okay, Serbia. You know, obviously, you said the majority of the people live in Serbia. They're um, mostly Christians, Orthodox, right, whatnot. Why Why are they so dependent on Slovenia and Croatia? If, if they want to bounce, why not just say, hey, peace, we'll do our own thing, become our own country, and that's cool? Well, that's what, what happened. Right. But see, this is what happened, ends up happening in 1992. I'm jumping. Um, Sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. Well, that, but, but yeah. I mean, it's a good question yeah. because this is, this is literally what ends up happening. So you, you um, there's a... <laughs> There's a pro there's a glitch in that because there's about two and a half or so million Serbs, ethnic Serbs, living outside of Serbia and Montenegro. Got you it. You have um, in Bosnia as well as in Croatia. As of 1991, you have a massive, massive Serbian po Serb population. Let's put the map up again, real quick, guys. Yes, yeah, please do. Uh, there's a it's the one the yellow one with the yeah. ethnics. Yeah, with the red and the or do you want the blues? Uh, the yellow and the blue or the no, the yellow and the, the red. One. Yeah, all right. Start over. Start your start over from the beginning so people understand this one. Right. Now, right. this is the, okay, the other so one. yellow one the is the one. map of the republics. Gotcha. Those are republic borders in 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 white. They, those are not ethnic borders. The next one you'll show was the ethnic borders after 1995. Got it. This is after 1995. So you see those those smudges in Croatia. Those are the last remnants of ethnic Serb presence. It mm -hmm. was much larger along that boundary, all along that boundary uh, with Bosnia uh, uh, between 1991 and 1995. And in 1995, Croatia, with American support directly, like coached by the Pentagon and retired U.S. officers and, and, and basically... Richard Holbrook's memoir, he was the chief diplomat at the time in charge of the negotiating the Bosnian war. He writes in his memoir that him and his colleagues from the State Department were literally telling the Croatians what, where to attack and what to do. Mm -hmm. And they described Croats as America's junkyard dogs. Mm -hmm. And Croatia basically obliterates these, these Serb enclaves and either kills or expels everybody who lived there. We're talking about a quarter million people at that point. And, and Bosnia, who were different ethnicity than them, or is it just these were these were ethnic Serbs living okay. in territory claimed by Croatia? Now, this is also important when it comes to Ukraine because you have advisors to the government in Kiev after 2014 saying we, we have to follow Croatia's example. Let's just get weapons and training from the Americans, and when the time is right, we repeat the Croatian scenario and just drive these you know vicious Russians back to Moscow or whatever. Okay, can I ask? So that's another thing that needs question? mentioning. Let me ask another question. Before we get into 1999 and mm -hmm. we start peeling into that beautiful article of yours, 
why to this point does NATO want to get involved? Why does the West want to get involved? Are there natural resources? Is it about just being a proxy uh, to poke at the bear in Russia? What's the main reason in your belief, because you know so much about the situation, why NATO wants to get involved? Is it just imperialism? Your thoughts? So part of it is imperialism. Um, there was a great book, and I'm getting ahead of myself because I need to get to, Co to the actual Kosovo War first, but I will, I will prequel this by saying that there was a book by somebody from the International Crisis Group in about 2003, 2004, where he basically said that the purpose of the Kosovo War was really to send a message to Russia and the rest of the world that no deviation from basically globalist liberal capitalism will be tolerated. Yeah, Serbia didn't want to didn't want to um, bend the knee, and therefore it had to be crushed. Got it. And that was, and the Albanians were sort of incidental. When you say Serbia didn't want to bend the knee, they didn't, did they also reject like the West Banking or? Yes, really they, they they insisted like, on the they, right. right. They well, they didn't. I mean, they were open to it. It's just that one of those, they didn't want to become a colony. Every other country in Eastern Europe basically sold off their assets and 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 submitted go their governments to the West and NATO and the European Union. And Serbia's like, no, we're not interested. We're independent. We have our own policies. We have our own rights, international law, so forth, so on and so forth. So um, when, but there was also throughout that whole process in Bosnia in particular, it may not have been the, the objective at the very beginning of it, but by 1995 or so, it became the objective of the U.S. basically saying, look, this U.N., order in which we have to follow the rules and in which the rules apply to us isn't really working out for us. We want to be able to act unilaterally. And so you have NATO throughout the Bosnian conflict slowly replacing the UN as the both the decision-making mechanism and, and the global authority. Mm. And from the, from the start, NATO's initially offering to help you know, here, here's, here, well, here's this handy military force that can, you know, help secure your peacekeepers and your humanitarian aid. And by August 1995, this, you know, helpful neighborhood NATO is, is literally getting involved in a war, bombing one of the parties involved. Mm -hmm. But this was a process, a slow process, step by step. You know, you, you, you want to call it a slippery slope. You want to call it boiling the frog. Any which way you slice it, at the end of, you know, by the time... The Dayton Peace Accords were signed in November of 1995. NATO had basically replaced the UN as the regional arbiter in Europe. Yeah. If you um, had to describe NATO in one sentence, we understand what the marketing is from NATO. What would you describe them as, Neb? Um, <laughs> in one right sentence? Go right at it. <laughs> Third Reich reborn. <laughs> Got it. I mean, NATO loves to talk about the European family of nations and, you know, how, how they're united Europe, secure and peace and so on. I mean, this is the literally the rhetoric that the Nazis used back in the 40s to advertise themselves, uh, you know, to, to the SS volunteers. I have this fantastic book of prop NATO uh, German propaganda mm -hmm. from the 1940s that was uh, published in Serbia. It was a, a, a Serbian scholar had put everything together and... and in one monograph and it just goes from your standard you know so many people were shot for defying the reich to wanted posters to this propaganda exhibit that basically purported to show how germany's winning everywhere how the entire europe is united against you know bolshevik satan and it's it, I, I kid you not let's say 75 percent of nato's rhetoric these days yeah is lifted right out of those posters it's uncanny Oh, they're just funding the Azov Battalion over there. For right, like, exactly. Like, it's like, like you know. they're not even neo-Nazis. They're Nazis Nazis. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but and like, and in this country, too, we have a bunch of people who like to wag their figure at imaginary Nazis while we're really funding crazy Nazis. It's right. Just, it, it, it's nuts. Um, I do have a question. So That's in 1991, I just want to re – this is a, re a recap before we keep continuing. So in 1991, Croatia broke free mm -hmm. of – Yugoslavia, same with Slovenia, right? Or mm -hmm. just, okay. Uh, and right now, then they were their own countries. Did did Yugoslavia still had Bosnia, right? Serbia, Montenegro, Kosovo, and Vojvodina uh, and Macedonia, right? Well, so Vojvodina and Kosovo parts of Serbia, right? six regions, right. one country, still in ninety one. Um. So in early ninety one, yes, and then Slovenia breaks off. Um, there's a week-long skirmish with federal troops sent to take the border 
Um, yeah. They call it a war. It's not really a war. It's it's a turkey shoot. Um, the the army's heart wasn't in it. The committee, it's their heart wasn't in it. It was divided. It wasn't getting anywhere. It was very clear at that point Yugoslavia wasn't going to be saved. And then the Soviet Union breaks up because Boris Yeltsin makes a deal with the leaders of Belarus and Ukraine yeah. towards in December 1991 to basically dissolve the Soviet Union, despite the overwhelming desire of its population for it to stay. And in January 1992, the European Union in um, becoming, so to speak, appoints this legal commission that basically says, well, you know, according to the Soviet precedent, Yugoslavia no longer exists. You're all separate nations now. Yeah. And we go, wait, what? <laughs> Serbia probably goes, whoa, whoa. Right. Yeah. whoa. So they, this is the whole death by recognition thing. They basically overnight declare that Yugoslavia is no more. And you was have been drunk at those freaking meetings that he had. In those was he ever meetings. sober? Never. I've never seen that dude sober. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So I mean, I'm not blaming the Russians for this. I'm just saying this is the backdrop of, of what happened. Yeah, I know. But we'll, we'll come back to that. You know, <laughs> this, this becomes relevant nine years later. Gotcha. So you have the, uh, the response to Bosnia's declaration of independence in Belgrade, the capital of Serbia and up, at the, up to that point, Yugoslavia is to basically implicitly recognize everybody. Uh, what Milosevic does in Belgrade is say, okay, fine, we're going to set up this thing called the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, consisting of Serbia and Montenegro, and we're going to carry on as the heir, as the successor state of Yugoslavia in international institutions. But the, here's the that Kosovo and uh, Macedonia. That includes Kosovo and Vojvodina, yes. Okay, gotcha. But not Macedonia because they're implicitly recognizing it. It didn't necessarily secede, but they implicitly recognize its independence. Gotcha. But here's the problem. Unlike what they did with Russia, the European Union and the US refused to recognize this. They're like, no, we're declaring your separate states. We refuse to recognize cont continuity of Yugoslavia and all the treaties thereof. You're still liable for all the debt, which is pretty substantial. And by the way, since we're declaring you aggressor in Bosnia based on no evidence whatsoever, we're imposing sanctions on you. Really? And, and you're still year, liable for all sanctions on Serbia and Montenegro. What year? 1990? This is 1992. 92. Got it. And uh, while you're under sanctions and your, your accounts are frozen, all of your interest still accrues, which is how Yugoslav debt went from $12 billion to like $30 billion by the end of the 90s. So obviously, Western creditors profited immensely, but that wasn't necessarily the motive behind this dismembering Yugoslavia. It was just the icing on the proverbial cake. Gotcha. All right. So this is 92. Uh, the war in Bosnia goes on till 95. Croatians um, eliminate their Serbs, either through expulsion or through murder. Bosnia gets partitioned, still remains a single country, but it, it gets partitioned. And here we think there's going to be peace, yeah. but no. At this point, the U.S., the, the Clinton administration decides, no, what we really need is another war in the Balkans. We need to take over Serbia because it's it's got it's putting on airs that it's independent and has rights and, and won't accept our neoliberal uh, post-Cold War order. And so in 1998, they encourage this ethnic Albanian insurgency that just started up and their speculation that the Germans again were the ones behind it initially mm -hmm. called the Kosovo Liberation Army. KLA. KLA or the UCK. Yeah. And initially they're they're horribly unsuccessful. The, the Serbian police alone ends up suppressing them. And then the State Department withdraws their designation as a terrorist organization, sends Holbrook again to the area to sit down with them. There's an infamous picture of him sitting down on the floor in some building with these, you know, bearded jihadist looking people with autom automatic rifles. And next thing you know, they're threatening to bomb Serbia unless it pulls back the military. And Belgrade says, fine, we'll let's get, you know, a, a foreign diplomatic mission to observe this and we're going to declare a ceasefire. Well, all that accomplished, and this is an OSCE mission. Now, if you remember, there was an OSCE mission in Donbass as well, starting in 1940. Oh, what, what mission? This is an OSCE, Organization for Security and Cooperation with Europe, in Europe. Gotcha. But as it turns out, the OSCE mission in Serbia 
was basically mostly British and American military intelligence. And they used those three, four months to liaise with the KLA, make a map of targets, deploy uh, communications devices, and then help the KLA stage this thing called the Rachak Massacre, yeah. which was basically the KLA getting obliterated in this one village, and then these people pretending that these were innocent civilians, and uh, using this as a pretext for intervention. You know what it reminds me of? Libya. That's the same. That's the same pattern they used. He, Libya is the ooh, same pattern they used. He's going to go remove the you know agitators or the people trying to you know turn o- overturn his government, and yet he went and bombed a bunch of innocent what? people. And that was it. Was like, and where do you think where do you think that that pattern came from? It, it was tested in Yugoslavia. Yeah, I see. So, so Rachak triggers this new uh, this ultimatum called the Rambouillet ultim- ultimatum after this French castle. Uh, which you know, Madeleine Albright is on the record saying you know, we needed to bomb the Serbs. We gave them an offer they couldn't accept. <laughs> we intended to bomb them, and that's what happened. Mm-hmm. So the Serbian delegation goes out there and says we will accept everything but this point, which demands free access. Uh, we, we we can we can agree on an independence referendum. We can agree to peacekeepers, but we will absolutely not accept that NATO will have the right to go anywhere in Serbia as it wishes and enjoy full extraterritoriality. This is occupation. This is the same thing Austrians asked of us in 1914. We cannot, no self-respecting country can accept this. And NATO says, fine, you're getting bombed. And on and this March, is this, is 19, this is March 1999. Okay, see, I'm confused because I remember Bill Clinton told us that he bombed Belgrade because God told him to do it. I mean, I'm not sure if if he thinks Hillary Clinton is God or Madeleine Albright. Sure but, maybe uh, in his ear. Bomb <laughs> Belgrade. Well, so the, the whole Kosovo thing came right at the time where Clinton was getting impeached over the Lewinsky thing, mm-hmm. and it was a very useful way to redirect attention. Mm-hmm. You, you launch a short, victorious war overseas to you know get the country united behind the rally behind the flag. Mm-hmm. You know, and and uh, the bonus points for Clinton was that he got to pretend to be the knight in shining armor, as opposed to you know what he actually was, by you know, rescuing these supposedly poor innocent ethnic Albanians being genocided by the evil Serbs who were just doing this out of being evil. Yeah. Hey, I, well, listen, you got You got to give credit where credit's due. This they're saying that Christians and Orthodox were killing Muslims, and that's why they did it. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so, so he's, so yeah, he's trying to get brownie exactly. points with the Muslim world after the yeah. Holy Rock business, right? And exactly. Well, it didn't work. Uh, First of all, the war uh, dragged on for 78 days. Uh, The U.S. lost uh, two stealth fighters, uh, one of which was acknowledged at the time because there was no way of getting around it. But the second one ended up getting hit so bad that it had to be scrapped. Uh, They just couldn't they just couldn't get it done. Who armed the Serbs? Uh, What do you mean warned? Armed, armed. Oh, armed. Uh, it was mostly domestic weapons. Uh, the Russians were supposed to send over some S three hundreds, but obviously canceled at the last minute because Yeltsin was fully in Western pocket. Now there was a there was a whole lot of problems in Moscow because there was a faction inside the Russian government that said, you know, NATO is attacking uh, our our you know, brotherly nation. We need to help them. And Yeltsin's like, no, we can't. We owe them too much money. And in the end, what happened was the Russians were instrumental in talking Belgrade into an armistice. Mm-hmm. Um, their deputy prime minister, I believe at the time, uh, came to Belgrade and said, look, you know, if you, he'll hear, let's accept a compromise. Let's do a UN peacekeeping mission as opposed to a NATO one. And let's have the UN security council guarantee your territorial integrity and make sure that, you know, there's no separatism and you can withdraw in good order and, in, and NATO will not have access to the rest of the territory. Does this sound reasonable? Mm-hmm. And Serbia said, of course it sounds reasonable. That's, that's literally what we told them three months ago. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, the moment NATO got into Kosovo, they literally trampled the agreement and you know just ran rampant and turned everything over to the KLA, and and it, that, that ended up with you know over two hundred thousand people getting expelled. But that's unfortunately and a topic of its own. Uh, but to illustrate that NATO doesn't keep to its agreements. Okay. So this is, and of course, there was a Russian unit that raced from Bosnia to secure the airport in Kosovo and meet the NATO peacekeepers coming up. And there was almost a shooting war over that at the time. And then they sort of worked out a way to work together. And, and then the Russians left after a couple of years. Now, here's, here's the, the, the important point to note, note. The moment NATO started bombing Serbia, mm-hmm. you had a lot of people in Russia from Alexander Solzhenitsyn onward 
going, what the hell just happened? Pissed off. And they were they were supremely pissed off. And basically, this broke their illusion that the West was their friend and they need to do whatever it takes to join it. This was the great this was not some sort of state propaganda because at that point there wasn't any. The, the, the government was still very pro-Western. And Putin, who ended up getting into power after Yeltsin resigned in disgrace in December, yeah. Um, there's all these theories that Kosovo was what basically drove the Russian uh, security services to say, look, we can't have this drunken idiot in charge anymore. And they replaced him with Putin, who I believe became prime minister in August. So just shortly after the yeah, Kosovo yeah, War. Yeah, yeah, totally. um, so yeah. you could draw a causal relationship between the Kosovo War and Putin's rise to power. So this is why he knows a lot about this stuff. But uh, Yeltsin's out by the end of the year. Putin's in, and he still tries to make a deal with the West, but the vast majority of the Russian public already is against it. And this is this is where we stand as of 2000. Now, in late 2000, the U.S. does a color revolution in Belgrade, gets rid of Milosevic, and eventually gets him transported to the Hague for war crimes trial, which was a kangaroo court of its own. And that's a side story. Uh, what happens in Kosovo at this point is for eight years or thereabouts, it's ruled by this UN mission. They have a viceroy just like Bosnia. They have NATO peacekeepers posing as UN peacekeepers. You have pogroms against Serbs that they fail to prevent. You have mass destruction of Serbian churches and villages, which NATO turns a blind eye to. And then in February 2008, counting on a pro-US government in Belgrade to do nothing about it, the provisional government of Kosovo, which was set up by the UN, declares independence. Well, Serbia, again, being ruled by a pro-U.S. government that doesn't dare to do anything about anything, um, goes to the U.N. and says, can they do that? And the International Court of Justice, in an advisory opinion, says, depends on what you mean by they and depends on what you mean by that. <laughs> you literally go to Clintonian word games. And these, these descending judges from Africa, and you know, there was a, several dissenters, one from the Arab world and one from Africa, basically said, this is... This is a this is a sleight of hand. They asked the questions that was asked was did the provisional government have the authority to do this? The question we answered was a group of citizens said. So they changed the question. And the ruling was in order to please the US, which immediately recognized the first country, funny story, the first country to recognize Kosovo as independent was Hamid Karzai's whistling government in Afghanistan. The one that's no more because the Taliban replaced it. Yeah, yeah. So much for you know democracy. What is Karzai thinking too? I mean, come I, on. He was I doing mean, what he was told by the U.S. It, 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 you know, he was once a puppet, then he wasn't a puppet. Then I, it, oh. Yeah. But anyway, so what year was that? By the way, say again. What year was that that he recognized? This is this is 2008. This is February 2008. The article was talking about started with the 1990s nines Kosovo War. Do you want to skip over that article, or do you want to point well, out? Um, let me just let me just get you get right. to the 2008 uh, IC uh, International Court of Justice decision and then sort of wrap it up everything because going chronologically is going to create gotcha. a problem. I understand. I got gotcha. you. Um, so you have so in this in this decision in which the International Court of Justice tried to whitewash the Declaration of Independence, they basically said, well, you know, if a group of citizens wants to declare independence, that's strictly speaking not illegal, but it doesn't really say anything about the legitimacy of their claim. So in other words, if you have a powerful sponsor like the U.S. government, you can get away with it. If you don't, then probably not. So that, that's, that's so much for international law, so much for rules-based order, right? Mm -hmm. So what you have in terms of Kosovo and what I've been saying you know, for better part of 20 years is that Kosovo is where the international law went to die. It started off with an illegal ultimatum because those have been banned ever since World War One, It continued with a completely illegal air war, bombing campaign, aggression, call it as you, what you want, uh, in which NATO attacked a third country, a non-member, a non that, that had never attacked NATO. Mm -hmm. At no point was NATO, any, it was not a defensive action by any ways, uh, by any um, stretch of imagination. So that the talk about NATO being a defensive alliance is completely bogus. They launched an attack, a war of aggression in defiance of their own charter as well as the UN charter. That's two. 
Three, their occupation of Kosovo was blatantly illegal because the, U the UN, which was supposed to be the arbiter of these things, said Kosovo is a part of Serbia. Despite yeah. that, the resolution 1244, they had the provisional government they set up under that resolution declare independence and then twisted the arm of the UN court to redefine terms in order to say that that's not strictly speaking illegal. And, and throughout, they replaced the government in Serbia through a color revolution, which hijacked democracy. There's literally unelected people hijacking democracy. This is a recipe we've seen since then throughout the Arab world, in Ukraine twice, yeah. in a lot of other places. Using the vessel of smearing the actual leader as a Satan guy, Milosevic, was put off all on the TV and your newspapers as some evil dude just killing a bunch right. of... Uh, and they've and they've used that same, right. yeah. and I mean that was that was also the, the amount of lies and propaganda in the Kosovo war was atrocious. Uh, I mean, after you know, they were saying you know, 10,000, 100,000, whatever killed, and then after the war, they found like a grand total of 2,000 bodies, half of which died as a result of fighting. It, it was it was just one of those baffling things like you you had in, you had police and, and security officers from nato countries writing up testimonials that you know we came in expecting a genocide and we found nothing what's going on here and of course they got silenced and this is you know early on in the internet age so a lot of people if it's not in the new york times it didn't happen but a lot of a lot of the west remained under this you know propaganda claim that you know nato had to act in defense of human rights or whatever but like everything about that war was was illegal, outright evil, or a lie. And then everything that was done to justify it retroactively was also a lie. There was a British historian called Kate Hudson, not the actress, um, who wrote in 2003 about the invasion of Iraq. There was a continuation of a pattern of aggression that began in Kosovo. She saw the invasion of Iraq as the, as the natural... Um, natural follow through of the Kosovo war. And she wasn't wrong. People are like, oh, it's completely different. This was Democrats and this is Republicans. No, it's not. There's no difference whatsoever. You follow the same pr procedure. You accuse somebody of uh, some kind of atrocity. You know, in, in Kosovo, it was human rights abuses. In Iraq, it was weapons of mass destruction. destruction same yeah. lie. Never having to say you're sorry you know, afterwards when it emerged that there were no weapons. Did anybody apologize? Did anybody resign? Did anybody go to jail? No, of course not. Yeah. So same, Yanukovych same might have been the only guy. To, I don't know Yanukovych. I don't, well, I, I mean Yanukovych went into exile, but I mean this was. But they didn't. They didn't like you know smear and crucify him as much as I thought. You know, I mean, well because they got rid of him quickly, quickly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, they, so, even, they didn't even need the smear to get rid of him. All they, all they had to do was Victoria Newland and Jeffrey Pryor go out in there and hand some cookies on the Maidan right. and say get him out of there. And and the thing about Maidan, the thing about the the, the Ukrainian coup of 2014. I mean, they had a coup back in 2004. When the first Orange Revolution happened in Ukraine, the Guardian ran an article by a journalist I used, I used to work with in Bosnia. I knew him personally. He has since passed away. Um, but he wrote up that, you know, in Ukraine, the U.S. is deploying a, a scheme. I'm paraphrasing right now, but the, the, he, he wrote that the U.S. is using a scheme developed in Serbia to, to win other people's elections. Like the Orange Revolution of 2004 was literally a hack of Ukrainian democracy. Mm -hmm. And when that government failed and ran the country into the ground, Yanukovych came back, got elected. And 2014, the, the Maidan coup was a way to do it again, except that he, they were impatient or Newland had already, you know, that famous phone call of hers predated the, the actual coup by several weeks, and she had already drafted, like, the composition of the new Ukrainian cabinet. The EU. Right. That was the famous phone call. Yeah, 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 that's you it. Know, this guy goes here, this guy goes there. Right there, yeah. And so they had, I guess they had to do this, and they went ahead and did the coup, and that triggered, again, along the Yugoslav scenario, which either they didn't anticipate or, you know, ret retconned into being part of the plan, that triggered the situation in Crimea, that triggered the conflict in Donbass. What people don't understand is that Donetsk and Lugansk are the two regions that successfully revolted. But Kharkov and Odessa also tried. And you had, um, you had in several other places, also people opposed in, in Eastern Ukraine, people opposed to the new regime in Kiev but they were brutally suppressed. 
I mean, in Odessa, most brutally, when those poor people were were locked up in the, in the, the, the trade union alive. house and burnt alive. alive. But you had you had people in Kharkov who were arrested and shot. You had you know you had the smaller roundups elsewhere, and yeah. then you had open warfare in the Donbass. But this is all stemming from the lessons and and the patterns developed yeah. during the Yugoslavian crisis. I have questions, and uh, it is two oh six. I don't know if you have to get out of here anytime soon. How much more time? Do you I, have have? A, I have a bit more time. Okay, good. Okay, so let's let's talk in 1999, right? Mm -hmm. uh, before Putin got in, and in fact, you know, I've heard the same kind of uh, rhetoric before that the fact that after what happened in Kosovo and in Serbia, they had to say, "Yeltsin, sorry, you got to get out there." Now, I think he used the excuse or the cloaking of a drunk, but if anybody knows how Yeltsin got into power, he was very close with the Clintons. A lot of people feel like he was bought by the Clintons, right? Why did Putin? kind of wait so long in this situation in Ukraine after after seeing what happened with Yeltsin that he's pretty much maybe the main reason he was removed is what happened in Kosovo. Why did Putin drag his feet and wait from 2014 to 2022 to make a move? Okay. Um, I'm going to, I'm, that was a question I asked myself actually, because, I um, question if, all the time. well, when you, when you look at his, his justification, his big speech, his justification for the current special operation and sending troops into Ukraine, you would think, okay, but the time to do this was 2014 or 2015 after it became clear that Ukraine didn't want to implement Minsk too. Yanukovych on his way out was telling Putin right. he needs to do something. I mean, in theory, if, you know, it, uh, when, when you talk about causes and consequences and legitimacy of intervention, you, you could make a case that he had a case in 2014 after the coup to send troops to, you know, restore democracy in Ukraine. This is what an American, this was what an, what an American president would have done. Yeah. 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 Or recognize um, the independence of the Donbass region right. right away. Now, and he didn't, he actually, he actually refused when they held a referendum to, of independence. So Moscow said we want nothing support, to do right? with this. Yeah. Now, yeah. I don't know this for a fact. This is speculation. I'm prefacing this. This is speculation on my part. I don't have any insider knowledge of this. Um, I, I can I could claim with uh, certainty that a large part of the reason Yeltsin was removed was was the Kosovo War because there's circumstantial evidence to that effect. I have zero evidence, pro or con, as to what I'm about to say. This is speculation on my part. Just so, so we're clear. Speculation. Go ahead. My feeling, based on certain statements partly by Putin, partly by others in his government, is that in 2014, they were not ready. Uh, what people tend to underestimate is how badly off Russia was by 99. Ten years under Western-style reforms that ha I have heard described, and this is the literal phrase I, use, I heard, this is not my phrase, it's called the rape of Russia. The sheer amount of wealth extraction, the amount of money and resources and lives looted, stolen from that country by its Western partners, as they like to call them. Yeah. By the, you know, the, the Harvard set, the consultants, the, the folks that came in, the, to who, who, who created the oligarchs, who created this wild capitalism that simply robbed... Um, confiscated the thing that the entire Soviet people were building for decades and privatized it to a small group of people with connections to the West. This, I mean, everybody quotes, you know, the demographic collapse and, and, and the lifespan issue and, you know, how Russia basically was, was, was went nerfed to the ground, so to speak. I mean, this, this you know, Yeltsinist Russia was a weak, failed state. The sheer amount of time and effort needed to turn that around should not be underestimated. The fact that Putin managed at all, I, a lot of people consider miraculous in its own right. As of 2014, I don't think, and this is my analysis at this point, I don't think they were ready for a war yet. I think both the West and Russia have been preparing for this confrontation ever since. We've got American generals on the record by saying, oh, yeah, we've been pouring weapons and, and training and, uh, you know, all this money into Ukraine, uh, you know, in anticipation of this. And you have Russians tacitly admitting that they had a contingency plan for just this 
not to say that they were planning to invade Ukraine all along, but they're like, okay, well, you know, if this doesn't happen, if the Minsk agreements don't get implemented, we may have to intervene and we may have to fight the West. So if we're going to do that, we better be ready. And it just took time. So you say the eight years from 2014 to 2022 made a difference for the Russian forces? Oh, absolutely. Russia. Absolutely. Absolutely. They're, they're what, industry. what evidence points to that, Neb? So I can just, because I know we have a couple, you know, non-believers in the chats right now. So they're kind of questioning a lot of things. Uh, only a couple, but what evidence do we have that the Russian Federation's army from 2014 to 2022 actually strengthened themselves or got ready for this situation? I mean, it's uh, Ukraine on their border. Well, there's there's two things to consider. Um, on, on one hand, you have the Russian army that um, got all these new weapon systems, got all this equipment and training, and a lot of it was produced domestically because Russians had to readjust their industry after the initial batch of sanctions in 2014. A lot of Russian economy was still oriented towards this globalist supply chain, and they had to uh, switch to domestic production uh, you know, we mock you know, Western media mocked them for cheese and all this other stuff. At no, the this time, is true, but, though. This, yeah, I I, 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 you know what? I do see that too as well. Now I get that. Yeah, I see. Now also maybe he wouldn't have had a lot of support, but I know there was a lot of people in 2014 that were mad at Putin. Well, no, in 20, right? Well, in 2014, there was a lot more support for intervening in Ukraine, yeah. and arguably, you could say that the Ukrainian military at the time was also much weaker and probably would have been a pushover. Like if 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 they had. And this is again pure speculation, but I could I could see, and I I, I imagine that uh, the, the gentleman who held Slavyansk for three months is also making this argument. Uh, what's his name, Strelkov? That had you know had the Russians intervened in 2014, this wouldn't have happened because they were going to get sanctioned anyway. So there was nothing really stopping them aside from the fact that their economy and their military weren't prepared. But had they sent, let's say, let's say for the sake of argument that they sent in troops in 2014 and blew away the, the Ukrainian military and regime changed the, the Maidan crew in Kiev, I'm not really sure we can game out what would happen then. Yeah. I mean, obviously, yes, there is an argument to be made and, and, and I've, I've speculated about it myself internally, like what would have happened had they intervened in time. Uh, because that might have been easier from a military standpoint, obviously, because, you know, you, you have both of these militaries building up and the Ukrainians were coming up from a much lower level. And obviously, even though it's not going to make much of a difference to the, to the uh, you know, outcome of the war at this point, uh, they would have offered much less resistance. Let's be honest. Yeah. It, it's I'm not the first one to say so. I'm but, thinking about everything what we talked about today, and I'm thinking about Putin's relationship with George W. Bush. And I think that's too because a lot of the you know United uh, because Russia was kind of a little bit of a pushover when it came to the Kosovo situation. They didn't do anything. They didn't react. I know a lot of citizens inside Russia were upset that you know the United States did what they did inside Serbia. Um, but I think that's maybe what allowed the fact that they were kind of like you know a little bit hesitant and backing off. Maybe that's what you know thought the American influence can continue to control Russia the way they controlled Yeltsin. What did Yeltsin say in '99? when uh, when uh, NATO was bombing Belgrade and a lot of Russians wanted to have them oh. take some type of action? Didn't he say something, we can't do it, they're my friends, we owe them money? Um, we, he, he literally, he basically said we owe them money because uh, Russia needed a massive loan from the IMF. And essentially the, the loan was approved. And when the loan came through, Yeltsin shut up about the war. And it was a betrayal and everybody knew it was a betrayal. The Russians knew it was a betrayal. But to illustrate the atmosphere in Russia at the time, let me just bring this up. So there was a there was a, a girl group called Tattoo. Uh, think like Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera type, you know, fluff for the youth at the time. Uh, it's about the right time period too. And so all of their stuff was, you know, singing about boys, speculating a little bit about a potential lesbian relationship, a little spicy, you know, that sort of thing. It was very much, you know, commercial calculated. And yet this is the band that records a song begging Yugoslavia, our little sister, for forgiveness because they couldn't help. Ah. Now, when a ultra commercial, you know, globalist brand band does this, you know the extent of the sentiment in the general public. 
this is not just you know cynical for profit stuff. This is this is genuinely like this is what the people want to hear. So let's give it to them type thing. And so this is the degree. I mean, again, I've done a lot of research into this because I was honestly curious. And just about everybody I've spoken with and every, everything I've read pointed to ninety nine as the decisive break between Russians believing that the West was inherently good and they should do whatever it takes to adjust and comply and saying, wait a minute, this is all a lie. We should reconsider. Mm -hmm. A couple of years back, um, I was invited to a showing of this new Russian action blockbuster called The Balkans Border. That's a co-production with Serbia that basically fictionalized the uh, dash to the Pristina airport and added this story about the old, old you know, th this this group of special forces trying to secure it from the uh, ethnic Albanian, the, the KLA, which were, so, again, sort of a photo robot of what the things that they've actually done, but only fictionalized for a movie. It's a huge commercial hit in Russia. So you, you look at the cultural policy, you look at the cultural sentiment in a society, and you realize that, you know, this is important. And this is, this is something the Russians have internalized. I can say this with confidence. This is not idle speculation on my part. The Russians really know a lot about the Kosovo crisis. They know that NATO was in the wrong. They know that uh, what the collective West has done has basically thrown international law overboard. And what they're doing today is basically saying, you have no right to object to us getting involved in Ukraine, not after what you did there. And they're not saying this is moral equivalence either. They're not saying, oh, we're acting just like NATO didn't know. No, they're saying that um, we have a treaty with these newly recognized states and they asked us to intervene to protect their people. And we're acting fully under international law. All of these documents are here and there. And NATO, you notice that Western critics can't really point to, you know, the specific uh, article in the UN Charter or anything like that as to why this would be illegal or wrong. They're just talking about my norms and how sovereign countries, well, they're talking sovereign countries, and then in the same breath, they're threatening to invade the Solomon Islands for striking a security deal with China. Because oh, well, you know, China wants to put a big ba Navy base there. I don't care what China wants to put in there. <laughs> they're not, be a Navy. Know, just, they're no, not no, really that's the thing. Like, yeah, yeah. No, but that's the thing. China could, could want to put a military base exactly. or a flower farm. It doesn't yeah. matter if the Solomon Islands are a sovereign country, as these people insist, yeah. then it shouldn't make a difference. Well, but obviously they, because they're lying about it because it's not true. And they're, you know what I'm saying? And, and I agree. This, this kind of uh, saber rattling in the South China Sea with China, it's called the South China Sea, ladies and gentlemen. Right, it's not, out of there. Yeah, yeah, it's not the North European right. Sea or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so let's uh, – is Bulgaria what, – what's it like now in Bulgaria? Bulgaria is not part of NATO, is it? It is. It is. Um, Bulgaria and Romania um, – Because um, you have them on the Black Sea, and now you have, right. you know, Russia taking the south part of Ukraine, pretty much cutting off Ukraine mm -hmm. from the Black Sea, saying, uh-uh, you didn't play nicely in the sandbox, now you don't get any uh, – water access over there what's it going to be like when it comes to obviously we know what turkey you know flees and the situation in georgia and all these countries that are surrounding the black sea but what's it going to be like with romania and bulgaria now as far as what's going on with russia do we sense there will be some of their like nato warships going out from that particular area or um so and I don't believe they have a lot of they, a lot of NATO ships in that area right now. No, no, they don't. I mean, the, the the thing about the thing about Bulgaria and Romania is that there's a thing called the Montreal Convention that regulates which nations can have ships in the Black Sea, uh -huh. uh, and it's it's it goes way back, and it's part of Turkish neutrality, and um, it basically safeguards it, it ensures there's no war between Russia and Turkey, and there have been many wars historically over this. So. Um, Romania and Bulgaria, Bulgaria specifically right now, have a, the people have a, a lot of buyer's remorse because they joined NATO in the 90s. Um, I forget the exact date, but them and, um, them and the Romanians were admitted into the EU very shortly after, um, both the EU and NATO, very shortly after the 99 war. Um, their, um, what they did, sort of, this, is, well, this was their ticket in. They banned, they closed their airspace to Russia, which was trying to fly in reinforcements to Kosovo. Mm. 
they were trying to fly in paratroopers to back up the, the peacekeeper unit that was at the airport. And Bulgaria and Romania said, you can't do that. And that was their ticket into NATO. But the running joke is that ever since they joined, they, the, Euro, the European Union has been basically sucking out their most productive citizens. They gave them European prices of goods, but not European salaries. And both Bulgaria and Romania have been further impoverished uh, over the years. You know, they joined the EU for prosperity, but the only people that got prosperous were the people hiring like Bulgarian plumbers that emigrated. Yeah. I remember a few years back, I was in, I was visiting my family in Bosnia, and we were watching this news, um, Serbian news show. My father was still alive, and he commented that he never thought he would see the day when uh, peasants in south southern Serbia, one of the most impoverished areas there is, were saying they were hiring Bulgarian illegals who would cross over and get uh, uh, look for like temporary working gigs digging up potatoes like the lowest of the the, the, um, the worst possible agricultural labor mm -hmm. and they're like wait a minute aren't they european union members and I'm like yeah they're european union members and that's what that's what the european union got them they were once the garden of of europe and now they've basically been banned from raising vegetables and reduced to you know, uh, hired hands in, on Serbian farms. I mean, this is how bad these things are. Obviously, this is, a, you know, just one illustration. But Bulgaria and Romania haven't been become prosperous as a result of joining either the EU or NATO. And now Romania is being fingered as a site of a potential new NATO base. The French are sort of leading that effort, trying to put in a brigade combat team or whatever near the border with, with Moldova, which is... Historically ethnic Moldavi, uh, historically ethnic Romanian, but has the whole Transnistria problem, and there's there's all sorts of other issues there. Um, even though they're this year, their uh, Eurovision song was all about unity between Romania and Moldova. Go figure. It's a catchy tune, but still, yeah. I, you know, I mean, there's Balkans is one of those places that, like Bismarck, was basically saying it's not worth the bones of a single Pomeranian grenadier because it's it's a black hole of Europe from his perspective and nobody wanted to listen. And when people abandoned his wisdom, you had world war one, you had world war two, you had this whole 1990s mess. You have the current mess. Like people yeah. seriously need to start reading their history again. It seems like that the United States knows this where the Western empires know this. And that's why they take advantage of the situation because it's so, it's so chaotic. I mean, there's been nothing that kind of equates the stability. So when we were talking about this region from 1914 all the way up, I mean, the only sense of stability came from the Serbian uh, people at one point and look what happened to them because they refused to bend the knee. So it, it, it's crazy. And the reason why I asked that question when it came to the black sea uh, knowing that you know that region is that I don't know if you know this, but Russia withdrew, I believe, from the Council of uh, Baltic Sea States. Uh, so I'm kind of looking at the region in the Black Sea and seeing what's kind of going over there, especially since now you have Sweden and Finland talking about, hey, we'll 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 join well, NATO. Maybe. So, so don't go don't go all Liz Truss on me. She's the one that famously mistook ba the Baltics for the Black Sea. They're two different bodies of water. Well, I know one's up over here <laughs> and one's down over there. I mean, the re so. yeah. But the reason I mean, the Russian I can, I can just see the Russians going, you know what? We're not playing games with you anymore. We're done. We're not going to try to make peace treaties. That's it. You cross the red line. Well, done. Well, there's. I don't know if there's a similar Black Sea Association, and I think the the if there is, and I vaguely think there might be. It also includes Turkey, and I think it's still a valuable forum for not having a war there. And there's really no mistaking that the undisputed sea power in the Black Sea is still Russia. Like yeah. no other no other country has a navy that could possibly stand up against the the, the Russian Black Sea. Fleet. But Turkey controls the gates in and out, correct? But Tur well, Turkey controls the technically controls who can enter, but Turkey also needs those gates to remain open. Gotcha. And so it's it's a it's a it's a it's a fine line. Like on one hand, they're selling Ukrainians the drones. On the other hand, they're buying missiles from Russia for air defense. And yeah. they're risking NATO sanctions over that. So, you know, Erdogan's playing his own game. He, he's in it for himself. Oh, yeah. But when it comes to the, to the Baltics, though, the decision to withdraw was precipitated by the Finns and the Swedes yeah. wanting to join NATO. Which is just dumb right now. It is really stupid. They're throwing away decades and, in Sweden's case, centuries of neutrality to join an alliance that is not a defensive one. It's literally an aggressive alliance intended to project American power 
first to Russia, and now they're even talking about projecting it to China. China obviously won't have any of it. Why Why would you sign up? I mean, if you were a Finn or a Swede, why would you sign up for a war with Russia or China? That's that's insane. I'm sorry, but that's stupid. It is dumb. And Finland being on the border, I mean, you know, <laughs> what do they want, a war between Helsinki and freaking St. Petersburg over here? It's just like, it's like, I mean, guys, what the hell are you guys doing? I think they've watched a little too many uh, uh, patriotic movies about the Winter War of 1940, but then they forgot to pay attention to the sequel yeah. and how that ended up in 1945. Yeah. I mean, you know, let's everybody who wants to refight World War II forgets that it ended with a Soviet flag over the Reichstag for yeah. a reason. Oh, yeah. And and I can tell you this much, though. You know, I, I, when I started getting up to speed in 2015 and I educated myself on what happened in 2014, and I was just blown away. And that's like, you know, obviously we got an out of boy from Joe being Joe Biden and everything that was going on, all the carpet bagging. It was just unbelievable. It's not just Joe Biden with his son in Burisma. Nancy Pelosi's son, Paul Pelosi, had contracts with energy companies inside of the Ukraine. You know, John Terry, and, yeah. uh, uh, Mitt Romney, uh, Adam Schiff from uh, uh, the opposition at the time, an oligarch, you know, that once got all the defense contracts, once the new government took over in 2014, after they uh, took care of the Maidan, you know, that that particular guy, I believe his name was Petrovich uh, or or Pasternak. I can't as Igor Pasternak. Pasternak, I think he had uh, uh, and I know he did. He had actual dinners to raise money for Adam Schiff. Twenty five hundred dollars a plate. If you want to just stay for cocktail hour, it's fifteen hundred dollars a plate. This is who Adam Schiff was in bed with. So then when he goes down to supposedly one of the most dangerous places right now, the Russian invasion, and now you have. The, the Republicans going there and Mitch McConnell. You had Adam Schiff going with the Democrats. Bono's performing. Angelique Jolene's walking around. I mean, do you really want us to believe that the Russians, that you would even step foot there if there was any threat from the Russians going in there? It's ridiculous. Well, but that's the thing. They go they go there and they claim that, you know, Russia's uh, indiscriminately bombing civilians. Well, if Russia's indiscriminately bombing civilians, then how are you, how do you believe it's safe enough for you to come in? You know, there, I mean, I was in Sarajevo during the war and there was this there was all of, you know, this similar thing like Bono came in after and, and he was also involved in that stuff. And you had all of these foreigners who went in knowing that they will be safe. Yeah. And that entire story about, oh, how you know we're going in to help you know, shine light on the plight of no, no, it's a it's a publicity stunt. Yeah. And it's a publicity stunt where and I'll, I'll this I mean, that people sort of assume this, but I will confirm it now. For the Bosnian publicity stunts, the right people had to get, had to get paid. Yeah. They had to bribe the local officials for the permission to help them. I believe it was that. literally a case of, you know, okay, what's my take? What's yeah. my cut? Exactly. And and people are, you know, we're we're coming here to help you. It's like I don't care what's in it for me. Yeah. How much money am I getting out of this? That's the sort of thing we're dealing with. And I I I, I am fairly confident that the situation in Ukraine is the same. You know, it's like, all right, well, you know, Bono, great, fantastic. Come in, you know, give a concert at the Kiev Metro. Now pay me. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's a globalist asshole. He's always around. I, You know, listen, the intelligence apparatus of the United States and the West is really sick. They understood what they were doing when they were arming the Azov Battalion because they knew at one point the Ukrainian military wasn't going to continue to just fire on its own citizens, right? So they had to get the weapons in the hands that they knew were crazy enough to do the things that they needed done to cause a kind of conflict in which, which we saw in Afghanistan when they armed the Mujahideen, right? Um, the KLA, in your mind, were they a little <laughs> crazy? I mean, why did why were they picked or why were they kind of backed? Were they the only kind of uh, group within Kosovo that was willing to kind of stand up against the Serbs? Or was this just another opportunity where like, oh, this group's pretty so, radical. We can use them to our advantage. The latter. Uh, there were two groups. There was the, for the for years the principal ethnic Albanian um, political grouping that was also fighting for independence was led by a man called Ibrahim Rugova, and he had this whole Gandhi thing going, very deliberately going for we're just going to go for obstruction. We're not going to cooperate with. Um, we're just going to create a parallel society. Yeah. sort of you know self-segregate here uh and you know create separate albanian schools separate uh hospitals separate everything and you know try to protest serbian society by shunning it and uh but rugova's approach 
you would think that that would be more humanitarian, but it didn't really work for the ultimate objective of NATO at the time or the Clinton administration, because that was what it was the one calling shots, which was regime change in Belgrade. Yeah. That Serbia was the prize in the sense that they needed regime change in Belgrade. They didn't care about Albanians in Kosovo per se. Had they cared about Albanians in Kosovo, they wouldn't have armed the KLA because the KLA actually killed, I believe, according to research I've seen, they've killed more Albanians than the Serbs. And, and that sentence works both ways. They've killed more Albanians than Serbs. And they've also killed more Albanians than the Serbs were accused of killing. Yeah. I mean, the KLA was murderous, and this was not just before the war, but also after, because every single potential witness against any of these commanders that uh, basically their their Western sponsors sought to control them, uh, both Tachi, who was the KLA leader, as well as Haradinai and, and a couple of others, they went into politics afterwards. And they sought to control them by basically holding these war crimes charges over their heads. And they would even get get them hauled away to the Hague on war crimes charges. And then all of these witnesses that were supposed to testify mysteriously stabbed themselves in the back 17 times or shot themselves in the back of the head type of thing. And multiple trials had to be, multiple charges had to be dismissed because, you know, there's a lack of witnesses. Nobody's going to testify because they're all dead. Yeah. But nobody protected the witnesses. It, it's crazy because the ultimate goal you said in Yugoslavia, right, was regime change in Belgrade, Serbia, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> They've said it out loud now, Neb. The ultimate goal in the Ukrainian situation is regime change in Russia. There, right. Lindsey Graham said there is no off ramp. We got to pour it on when it comes to Ukraine. Uh, right. And yeah. what the Ukrainians don't understand or do, but there's nothing. There much not much they can do about it. Is that they're literally being used as pawns and proxies by the West. The they're war on Russia. About them. The United States, just like you say, they don't care about the they didn't care about the Albanians. Of right. Well, obviously, the United States Ukrainians there. Yeah. Um, obviously, the United States government doesn't care. But the, the 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 most horrifying thing in this entire story is that if the people inside Ukraine do realize this, that they're being used and sacrificed, there's not much they can do about it because the U.S. is propping up their government and has also armed to the teeth these Nazi battalions. And, you know, you, you, you can call them Azov, you can call them IDAR. There's, there's multiple names, but it's basically a single organization that has the same values, that uses the same SS insignia, and it's, it's acting like the enforcers of the government who will literally come to your house and have you shot if you dare criticize the government, much less become an opposition. Zelensky outlawed the opposition. He closed down any media that didn't agree with the state line. Yeah. And we call them a democracy. Yeah. It's obviously nonsensical. He did that a while ago, too, as well. You know, it's like people don't realize and stuff like that. And some of the laws were saying that they couldn't speak in their native tongue in certain like, you know, it's just please. You know, well, and that's the other thing. Like Serbs were denounced as oppressive aggressors for maintaining an Albanian language university. You could literally spend your entire life in Kosovo without speaking Serbian for a day. Yeah. And that was termed oppression. Whereas when you are banned from speaking Russian in Ukraine or Latvia or Estonia or any of these other NATO member states, that's democracy. Now, riddle me that. That obviously has no relationship to any sort of principle whatsoever. And it only matters is who's in charge and, and you know, who's serving NATO interests. Um, we've been spending a lot of time here. Uh, Warren, just go to slide 17. I want to play it real quick. That is the Bernie Sanders stuff. This is something that somebody told me about a long time ago, like pasta. Uh, you don't understand that Bernie is not great in uh, when it comes to foreign policy. I said, well, he's better than most. He says, yeah, but I don't believe like, you know, at the end of the day, he's going to buckle. Uh, so we're going to play this really quick. Get your opinion. We'll get you out of here. We've had you for almost an hour and a half. Uh, thank you so much, Neb. Uh, of course. Here's, here's Bernie Sanders in 1999. The gentleman from Vermont's recognized. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, the Constitution is very yeah. clear. We don't have volume. It is the United one. States Congress which has the power to determine issues of war and peace. You don't have it, buddy? Make sure your volumes are on here.
The gentleman from Vermont is recognized. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. Speaker, the Constitution is very clear. It is the United States Congress which has the power to determine issues of war and peace and yep. to decide whether our young men and women are put in harm's way. It is the President who is the Commander-in-Chief of the military. It is the Congress which determines whether we use that military. I have heard today that some people think that the U.S. participation in Kosovo now is unconstitutional. They are right. But the U.S. participation in Vietnam, Grenada, Panama, and many other conflicts which took place without congressional authorization were also unconstitutional. The time is now for this Congress to stop abrogating its constitutional responsibility to the White House and to start seriously addressing the issues of war and peace. Frankly, I am extremely concerned about the process that has taken place today on an issue of such enormous consequence and at a time when Congress has an inactive schedule, it is an outrage that we only have a few hours to discuss the issues of war, the expenditure of billions, and the potential loss of life of American military personnel. And I hope we rectify this situation in the coming days and weeks. This should not be the last debate on this issue. Mr. Speaker, my assessment of the situation at the present moment is that Mr. Milosevic is a war criminal and that ethnic cleansing, mass murder, rape, and the forced evacuation of hundreds of thousands of innocent people from their homes is unacceptable and cannot be ignored. Sadly, because Mr. Milosevic has negotiated agreements which he has then ignored, I have supported the NATO bombings of military targets. I believe that the Serb military and police must be withdrawn from Kosovo, that the hundreds of thousands of people uprooted from their homes must be allowed to return, that Kosovo must be given some kind of self-rule, and that an international peacekeeping force should be established to maintain order. Mr. Speaker, I believe that we must strive as hard as we possibly can to find an alternative between doing nothing and allowing ethnic cleansing and mass murder to continue and the continuation of a war which will certainly result in terrible destruction, large numbers of casualties, and the